Laura, do you want me to go to full screen on this presentation or as is? I think as is, uh, okay. as you said, uh, we've uh, let everyone out there know we've had some little technical difficulties. So uh, we're going to leave the uh, format of the screen how it is, uh, since we know this will work. Okay. Again, my name is Laura Fleek. I'm an adult programming librarian with the Fresno County Public Library, working specifically out of the Woodward uh, branch. We have partnered, um, the Fresno Master Gardeners are graciously doing a wonderful series of programs. Uh, Tim Sullivan is doing today's program on drought management. Roz Tampone will tell you about some of the other uh, upcoming programs at the end today. We will be doing a Q&A after Tim's presentation, so have those questions ready to go. And now I'm going to hand it over to Tim. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, my name is Tim Sullivan. I'm Master, Fresno Master Gardener, class of 2011. So I've been a, a Master Gardener for about well, 10 years now. Previously, I was a, a farm appraiser. So uh, I am familiar with the water situation in the state of California and it's really been a challenge. Um, unfortunately, there's just no easy solution to this problem. And the bottom line is, in my opinion, you know, we just have a limited amount of water, but a very high demand for it. So um, your goal, I think, as a homeowner, is to learn to manage your garden in a drought efficient way every year, not just during periods of extreme drought, but every year to learn to manage the water in your garden efficiently. So um, this is something I keep track of. It's the California Drought Monitor and you can see uh, we're not in very good shape. This is as of April 29th. And you can see much of Fresno County uh, is in extreme drought. Uh, some of California is actually an exceptional drought. Um, none of California is in no drought. So uh, this is starting to be kind of normal for, 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 the, for the state of California. We're just not, we're constantly fighting uh, a water shortage. Uh, this year it was really, to me, pretty much unprecedented as the Department of Water Resources came out with an initial allocation of 10%, which is very low uh, for water to the farmers and they cut that water allocation to 5%. So usually what they do is they come in with a very low ball estimate in December. And then later on through the year, they raise that estimate uh, depending on uh, rainfall and snowpack. And it was uh, shocking to me that the uh, Department of Water Resources actually lowered the allocation from 10% to 5% to the farmers. So this is, uh, we're in drought again, and we're gonna have to learn to deal with this. I've come to the conclusion that drought is a part of the California landscape, and we're just gonna have to learn to deal with it. So what are we gonna do? You need to have a drought plan. And uh, here's a list of items that I think you need to do in order to deal with this situation. Number one, thoroughly check your sprinklers. You need to learn to test your sprinklers and to fix your sprinklers. Number two, it's all about the trees. If we hit a very severe restriction in the state of California, like in 2015, I believe, they came in with a 27% reduction. Um, you need to learn to save your, you have to have a plan to save your trees. Your trees are generally the most valuable part of your landscape. If the, your trees die, it will cost possibly cost you thousands of dollars to have them removed. So you need to have a plan that saves your trees if we hit a situation where uh, the state comes in and really restricts water. Lawn care during drought, I'm gonna talk about that. There's a, a pretty simple solution to dealing with that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that. Ion water, use ion water to check for leaks. Ion water is an amazing app that is available free to the uh, to Fre the city of Fresno, people who get their water from the city of Fresno, and it helps you monitor your water online. For those of you who don't know, your water meter, if you live in the city of Fresno, you, your water meter is hooked up by Wi-Fi to the city of Fresno, and that information is available to you uh, using ion water. Mulch, mulch, mulch. 
this is something I'm very big on. Uh, for some reason, I think it's just a cultural reason. The people in Fresno don't mulch their gardens. They don't mulch their flower beds. So they like to remove all leaves and yard debris and come in there and spray uh, pesticides or herbicides uh, to keep the weeds away when they should be using that yard waste. Just leave it there, you leave the leaves there uh, and use that as an amazing benefit to the soil. And I'm gonna talk about that. Trip out smart controllers. This is a new innovation. Well, they've been around for about 10 years and um, it's an amazing technology that's available to the homeowners now. A lot of times you can get rebates. It can help you control uh, your water from your iPhone or from your computer. And uh, finally, I'm going to talk about what you shouldn't do. During the last drought, um, I was a mess gardener, I was teaching irrigation, and the big thing was to you know, remove your lawn and convert your garden during the drought to a drought tolerant landscape. And that really turned out to be a very poor decision because the problem, there are many problems, I'm going to talk about it, but the main was main one is if you convert your garden during drought, you're not gonna save any water. You may use more water than if you just kept your lawn uh, during the drought. So number one, you wanna fix your sprinklers. That's probably the biggest thing you should do right now. You know, it's amazing to me. I like to take walks around my neighborhood and other neighborhoods in Fresno early in the morning. And people just don't fix their sprinklers. I see all kinds of broken heads, broken pipelines, and water pouring down the street. So you really need to focus right now on fixing your sprinklers. One of the best maintenance things you could do is to blow out your line at the end of the run. So you, let's say you have a, your lawn sprinklers, you pull off the head off the end of the line and blow it out. And there's probably a bunch of debris in there that's clogging up your sprinklers. So you wanna blow out that line and then you wanna check for leaks. Now during the summer, I really recommend you test your sprinklers every week. You know, sprinklers get misaligned. You know, kids run over them with bicycles. You kick a sprinkler off, get hits with a lawnmower. So you really need to test your sprinklers every week. And you really need to learn to use your controller's test program. Almost every controller I know of has a test program where you can go through and uh, test your, your valve stations and uh, observe every week. I know on mine, I have a smart controller. I just set up the test program. It's very easy. It runs for three minutes per station. I can go around and check uh, every valve station. And the big thing here is to align heads. I see this at, uh, it's quite shocking. Uh, you know, I go for early morning walks and I see uh, people uh, spraying water out in the middle of the street instead of on their turf or on their shrubs. So uh, you really need to go through and test your sprinklers and align your heads and check for leaks. So let's say we get into a situation where there is a mandate from the state uh, where there's a severe restriction. Uh, it's all about the trees. At that point, you're gonna really try to focus on saving your trees and uh, your turf and your shrubs are probably gonna have to suffer. But what you wanna do is you wanna do at least a twice a month deep irrigation. You wanna take what water is available to you and irrigate your trees. It is very, very expensive to remove a tree uh, in the thousands, it could be in the thousands of dollars. So you really wanna focus on your trees if we get into exceptional drought. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about something from the California Center for Urban Horticulture. This is a division of, of UC Davis and we as master gardeners are part of the UC program. And they've come up with what's called a tree ring irrigation contraption. And there's a website where you can go to, the, go to the California Center for Urban Horticulture, and it shows you how to assemble and program this contraption. And these are the parts. And basically it's setting up a drip line around your trees and using uh, uh, your garden hose just to irrigate these trees. So uh, it's really a great resource. I don't think we're there right now as of yet. But if we hit some really tough irrigation restrictions, you should be aware of this tree ring irrigation contraption and be, uh, be able to go in and, and save those trees because that's gonna be your number one goal if we hit some uh, severe irrigation restrictions. 
Lawn care. One of the best things you can do and which most people don't do in Fresno is to mow high. Uh, or don't even, if we do hit severe restrictions, I don't even mow at all. Uh, Dr. Baird from UC Riverside recommends not even mowing your lawn at all during periods of severe drought. And the reason you wanna do that is you wanna maximize photosynthesis. The longer the grass blades are, the more photosynthesis and the more root development you get. So you, uh, you definitely wanna mow high. The, probably the best thing you can do for your lawn in Fresno is to learn to mow high. Most people don't, most people mow their lawns way too short. And that uh, is very tough on your lawn, especially in the middle of summer when you have a cool season grass like tall fescue and it's struggling to survive these high temperatures. Um, it ju it's just very difficult for these tall fescue lawn, cool season grasses to, um, to survive the summers. Now you can use an edger, you can, or you can use a string trimmer to edge a, a, a lawn that has MMOs and you can use a string trimmer to clean up uh, the lawn, but um, so to make it a little bit more uh, presentable, but uh, the main thing is here, you want to let your grass grow during drought because if you're not watering it, it's really gonna struggle. Brown is a new green. Uh, this was kind of a saying made uh, during the last drought and I don't think it really, you know, really was accepted by the public. You know, a brown lawn is never going to look as good as a green lawn. And so I question whether, you know, brown is the new green. Your goal is not to try to accept a brown lawn. Let your grass grow. You don't probably have to mow it at all. You can uh, trim it with a string trimmer and uh, try to keep it as green as possible. So there, here are my recommendations. And you should probably even do this right now because of the water situation. You want to prepare your turf for uh, severe drought even now, because now there seems to be water available to homeowners and uh, we wanna use that water as efficiently as possible. So you wanna trim tall fescue to four inches and you wanna trim Bermuda to two inches. Now you see John Rixman's tall fescue at, at three inches and Bermuda at one inch. So I'm gonna recommend you even go an inch higher to try to really help with that photosynthesis and keep your lawn somewhat presentable in case we run into some more severe drought restrictions down the road. Here's a great publication from UC, publication 8006, Mowing Your Lawn and Grass Cycling. Talks about how to mow your lawn. Again, most people in Fresno really do not mow their lawn correctly. Uh, they mow it way too short. Grass cycling is very is simply leaving the clippings on the lawn. And that does an amazing thing. It adds organic matter to the soil and Again, I can tell, I, I can see a lawn that's been grass cycled and very, very few people leave the clippings on the lawn. I really recommend you go to this publication and learn how to mow your lawn correctly because that will really help your lawn, especially in the periods of drought. Ion Water. Ion Water is a great app. It's uh, free from the city of Fresno and it tells you your daily water use. For those of you who don't know, uh, if you live in the city of Fresno, uh, there is a Wi-Fi uh, function on your water meter that uh, every hour sends, I believe every hour, sends information to the city of Fresno. Well, that information is available to you through uh, Ion Water. And it also, the city of Fresno is able to monitor your water use so they will know if you're in violation of water restrictions. Uh, the information comes directly from the Wi-Fi at the meter, and uh, it's really a great resource for a homeowner. And for those of you who are not aware of it, I, I, hope, I, I hope you become aware of it. And, and it is such a powerful source of information, I recommend you do it now. You can contact Landscape Conservation if you have a problem setting it up. I think they'd be more than happy to help you. So here's uh, from the Ion Water website, connect, calculate, conserve. The Ion Water tool allows City of Fresno customers to connect to their water utility accounts and view their latest water usage on their desktop or mobile device. Ion Water helps customers understand their water usage, detect leaks, and discover their watering trends. 
Customers can quickly view recent water usage with a two-week comparison and view detailed water usage history by the hour, day, week, month, and year. It's a huge amount of information that can help you understand your water usage and your water bill. And so to register for Ion Water, visit fresno.ionwater.com slash sign up or download the Ion Water app on your mobile advice. I download, it was very simple for me to uh, set it up and uh, I use it all the time. I'm constantly water monitoring my water use. Here's a, um, here's a, a picture from my water use. Uh, one of the things I, I think you should take a look at on the upper left. You said no leak detected. Great job. Uh, you know, if you leave a hose bib on, if you have a, a leak somewhere in your system, if a valve that's leaking in your irrigation system, this will notify you if you have a leak. So this is a great resource for monitoring leaks. And it also is great for monitoring usage. You can monitor by the year, by the day, by the month, by the week. And so you can really get a great handle on how much water you're using. And again, you know, in my opinion, we are uh, dealing with water shortages, just part of owning a home in Fresno. And so this is part of home ownership is, is monitoring your water usage. And this is a great tool at Compliment the City of Fresno for making this available uh, to Fresno homeowners. Uh, I use it all the time and it is a great tool. I know last year I, um, I started seeing higher usage in my water bill and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so I started investigating my irrigation system and sure enough, I had a leak and uh, I found the leak and I fixed it and my water usage went down uh, quite a bit. So uh, really recommend you uh, take a look at using ion water. Mulch, mulch, mulch. This is something master gardeners very much believe in, but for some reason, uh, homeowners in Fresno don't. Uh, why don't Fresno homeowners mulch? I think it's a cultural thing. I, people just got used to having that sanitized look of removing all yard waste or mulch and spraying uh, herbicides over the bare ground. The problem with that, the soil compacts, it doesn't accept water, the soil dies out, and um, it's not good for your garden. Uh, you wanna use organic versus inorganic mulch. Some people use those plastic mulches. I don't recommend that. Uh, yard waste is probably the best mulch you can use. Uh, for one reason, it's, you know, it's free. I use fall leaves, grass clippings, and, and I also use chop, it says something called chop and drop. When I prune my shrubs and trees, I chop it up and, and then I use it as mulch in my garden. It works great. And what's really great about using uh, yard waste is uh, it helps the biology of the soil. Uh, so many of our soils have been dried out and are compacted because we've just, there's no uh, organic matter in them and they're just, they're basically dead soils. But if you mulch your soil and that will protect the soil and the biology of the soil will actually feed on that decaying mulch and your plants should do, should do dramatically better. Grass cycling, we talked about this earlier, that's like mulching your lawn. You wanna leave the grass clippings on the lawn. Um, again, it's something, it's a cultural thing. I don't see very many people grass cycling. For some reason, they feel they have to remove the grass clippings. Some people at one time thought that it would contribute to thatch. They've proven that it doesn't. Uh, UC uh, really recommends grass cycling, in fact, uh, they did a study up at UC Davis and they found that after two years on a grass cycling program, a tall fescue lawn would uh, require a 25% decrease in fertilizer use. Personally, I think if had they continued that study, had they gone to like five years, they would have seen a substantial uh, decrease in the use of fertilizer. Because uh, grass cycling, what it does is it really adds soil organic matter. It makes your soil much healthier and uh, it's like mulching your lawn. So uh, my recommendation is if you're mowing your own lawn, leave the clippings on the lawn. If you have a gardener, tell them to leave the clippings on the lawn. Here's a picture of a well-mulched well garden. You can see, um, to me, it's a very attractive garden. Mulch really helps down, really helps with weed prevention. It helps with 
maintaining soil moisture. Uh, plus, I just think it's a much more attractive garden. A well mulched garden is a much more attractive garden. Smart controllers. Uh, these are Wi-Fi connected. I know uh, I have recommended to uh, my friends and family to uh, go ahead and get one of these smart controllers. So uh, the Wi-Fi is hooked up to the Wi-Fi, it's hooked up to weather information, and it automatically calculates your runtime uh, based on parameters that you input into the smart controller. It automatically sets runtimes, and if you have a problem setting it up, landscape conservation from the city of Fresno will help you program. But I'm gonna to recommend to you that you should learn how to program. There's a lot of tutorials, usually by the uh, manufacturer that will help you learn how to use your smart controller. But what's really amazing is, it's, is the ease of changing a schedule. I very rarely spend any time with my smart controller anymore. I've had one for over five years. It's amazing. It is amazing technology. I used to think in my classes I taught that unless you're willing to sit down and learn how to use a smart controller, uh, you probably shouldn't get one. But my thinking has changed on that. I, I don't think you have a choice. Because we're constantly dealing with these drought issues, this technology is available to you. You can get rebates from the city of Fresno. You really need to get on this, talk, on this technology if you're a homeowner in Fresno and um, learn how to use it because it is so, so much easier to deal with, with water situations by using the, one of these Wi-Fi connected smart controllers. Again, I'm gonna refer you to California Center for Urban Horticulture. This is again a division of UC Davis. Smart controllers, commonly referred to as ET controllers, weather-based irrigation controllers, smart sprinkler controllers, and water smart controllers are a new generation of irrigation controllers that utilize prevailing weather conditions, current and historic evapo transpiration. Evapotranspiration is a fancy word for water need. Soil moisture levers, levels and other relevant factors to adapt water applications to meet the actual needs of plants. This section has several articles that discuss selection and evaluation of smart controllers for California. So you wanna to go to the California Center for Urban Horticulture and you can do some research there. I would also contact Landscape Conservation. If you do decide on a smart controller, you wanna make sure uh, that you're gonna get your rebate and it's on their qualified list. Here is a, uh, here's the form, uh, a rebate form for the smart irrigation controller. Uh, again, I'd recommend you probably call them before you buy a smart irrigation controller. They um, will give you all kinds of information to help you in your decision. Uh, but again, you know, one thing they do is they come out and they help you, they, all, they will come out and help you program it. I really recommend you take the time to learn how to use your smart irrigation controller so you can change your uh, run times and your input information uh, very easily. Um, if you have to wait for the city of Fresno, do it, that's gonna be very cumbersome. Very rarely do I have to change mine, but it's so easy uh, when I have to change information in my smart irrigation controller. I, I really spend very little time on, my irriga on the irrigation in my garden anymore. Most of the time I spend is testing my irrigation and a smart irrigation controller. Uh, I have an irrigation controller called a Ratio and it's so easy to change the, uh, or to test my irrigation. I do it often in the summer, maybe even once a week to make sure that my garden's being irrigated correctly. Other than that, I really don't do, do anything on my irrigation. It's okay, do not convert your garden during drought. This was the big lesson I learned during the drought, 2014 to 2017. I, um, generally what I do for the Master Gardens, I teach irrigation. And uh, at that time it was very popular for people to take their lawns out and convert their gardens. I think that was a big mistake. That's uh, a big lesson I learned. New gardens require at least as much water as lawns. So you're not gonna save any water in the middle of the drought by converting your garden. And not only that, it is very difficult to get plants established in the Fresno heat. So you're gonna use as much water or more water than your uh, old garden and your garden may fail because it's so difficult to establish a new garden in the summer here in Fresno. But if you do decide to 
go to a drought tolerant garden or to change your garden. Uh, I recommend you spend this summer, this spring and summer, uh, investigating and plan for your new garden and plan on uh, putting in your new garden in the fall when the temperatures are cooler. You can learn about all the different types of plant materials and irrigation systems. California Center for Urban Horticulture is a great source of information. Uh, garden decisions can be quite difficult, whether you want to go with drip irrigation or spray irrigation, you need to think about that. You need to have a plan. I have converted my garden and I knew that I had to have a plan and I set a plan up and it went rather smoothly. But unfortunately, it seems a lot of people have really struggled uh, with the gardens they've converted. The plants did not do as well as they had hoped. And uh, it's just a much more complicated decision than I think the average uh, person could um, could plan on. So uh, you, you want to make sure and really spend your time researching this issue before you uh, go ahead and, and convert your garden. And the other thing you want to do, there are rebates out there. Fres City of Fresno have some rebates and there are exemptions available. So you want to contact Landscape Conservation. You know, when I took out my, I did take out my front lawn and there was a state rebate for turf removal. I don't think it's available anymore. Uh, but you could save probably quite a bit of money by researching the rebates and exemptions. So in summary, I think in Fresno it's gotten to the point where we're always in drought. So you always wanna have a drought plan. You always want to, um, in the back of your mind, what am I gonna do if we have a drought? What am I gonna do in my garden? So you're gonna want, definitely, you know, if we hit a severe drought, your goal is to save your trees. Uh, you want to test and fix your sprinklers often. Uh, I see so much water pouring down streets when, again, when I go for walks. You know, I, I've always thought we should have a fix your sprinkler day here in Fresno, and uh, that would do a, we could save a huge amount of water. So uh, I don't think they're going to do that, but I, I think it's something that's part of being a homeowner. You just need to learn to test and fix your sprinklers often. The California Center for Urban Horticulture is a great resource. I go there all the time, it's constantly being updated. Uh, Dr. Fagino and Dr. Oki uh, were the two professors involved with the uh, California Center for Urban Horticulture. I've attended many of their lectures. Uh, they're all over this issue. They are uh, doing a great job in helping the uh, homeowner deal with water situation and gardening issues in California. Uh, one recommendation I might make to you is if you get a chance to go up to the UC Davis and tour the UC Davis Arboretum uh, garden. It's, uh, it's a beautiful garden. It shows a lot of water-wise plants. The California Center for Urban Horticulture is actually uh, setting up a kind of a garden of the future for California. Uh, they're in the process of building it right now. I've been up there several times. I they're not finished with it yet, but uh, I'm really looking forward to what they're coming up with. So it's a great resource. If you're interested in uh, converting your garden, that might be a great trip for you this summer instead of, uh, I believe, wasting your time and trying to uh, convert your garden here uh, in the summer. Uh, take a trip over to UC Davis and take a look at the UC Davis Arboretum and see what the California Center for Urban Horticulture has come up with. And finally, uh, Tim, the water wise gardener, that's me. Um, every quarter I write an article for the Fresno Master Gardeners. It's on our Fresno Master Gardeners website. And I am constantly researching and coming up with ideas for ways the homeowner can save water and irrigate their garden uh, more efficiently. So just go to the Fresno Master Gardeners website and you should be able to find uh, many of my articles are uh, my, the articles I've written several months ago are still online. So uh, uh, I recommend you uh, read my article every quarter and uh, you'll uh, hopefully learn something from reading Tim the Master, the Waterwise Gardener. And with that, my presentation is done. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to help you.
Well, Tim, thank you so much. I feel like I should run home and rip out my entire system that I have. It's so inefficient. I literally was taking frantic notes <laughs> during this, although let everyone know we did record this and it will be posted on the uh, Fres uh, Fresno Public Library website and we will try to get a recording of this to the Master Gardeners as well. Um, we have a number of questions that have been coming in while during your presentation, so uh, let me get started. Someone asked, which I do think is interesting, is, is there water monitoring, do you know of in other cities or counties, uh, particularly here in the uh, Central Valley? Obviously, Fresno had it. Uh, they're wondering if other cities like Kerman have it as well. I don't know if Kerman has it. Um... I know Ion Water is available to many cities throughout the state of California. You need to contact your water provider to see if that resource is available. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, so I have a couple specific questions. Oh, someone asked if you could uh, just re um, repeat uh, the site for the tree ring irrigation that you had uh, talked about. Right. It's called a tree ring irrigation contraption, and you want to go to the California Center for Urban Horticulture. Just Google California Center for Urban Horticulture, and it should come right up, and you will be able to find the tree ring irrigation contraption. Okay. Uh, let's see. actually had a couple redwood uh, tree questions. Uh, one was saying that their uh, redwood tree, that uh, looks like they're in Awani, is getting brown or looks like it might be dying at the very top. Mm -hmm. Is there something going on with the tree there and how can they fix it? Well, it's hard for me to say without seeing it. I can tell you, you know, when I was went through the Master Gardener training, redwood trees were very looked down on as being water water users. I don't really share that opinion. I think the issue is we need to, at UC da at the UC Davis Arboretum, they have a, a redwood tree grove that is absolutely spectacular. These redwood trees can do well in the Central Valley. Uh, the one thing I think people do mistakenly is they remove all the pine or all the leaf litter from the mulch. For, from the uh, underneath the tree. And so uh, there's bare ground underneath the redwood trees. They need to leave that mulch there and they need to make sure it's getting adequate water. Uh, the crop coefficient, I'm not gonna get too much into that is about 0.7 for redwood trees, which is a little bit less than a lawn. So you wanna make sure your that tree is getting enough irrigation and you wanna make sure that you're not removing all that leaf litter underneath the redwood trees. And how often then would you recommend um, you water a redwood tree or provide? How much water should they be getting? That is dependent on your soils. Uh, what you wanna do is you wanna irrigate and I would wanna get that water down two feet. So what you wanna do is after you irrigate, um, say the next morning you go out with a long handle screwdriver that's at least two feet long and make sure that water gets down two feet. It's not so much how often is how deep that water gets. Mm. Okay, this is a good question. I thought it says, uh, had someone ask, what does deep irrigation mean in practical terms? For example, how long do you leave the hose on the tree? But I think you maybe answered part of that by depth. Right, I think what she's getting at there is something uh, we call effective rooting depth. And that's gonna depend on plant material. So I use the one, two, three rule, one foot for turf, two foot for shrubs, three foot for trees. Now, getting the water down three feet can be a challenge, especially in the summer with these water restrictions. So uh, again, use a long handle screwdriver or some type of metal uh, pipe or something, or, or you can use a shovel and after you, the day after you irrigate, you wanna go down and dig down and see how deep that water's getting. The, probably the biggest problem with, uh, one of the big problems with home gardeners is that they do not irrigate deeply enough. You know, and the deep roots are what's gonna make your garden uh, drought tolerant. Okay, have a couple. 
<laughs> uh, someone asks, uh, what if you already have an established garden and want to convert a sprinkler system to drip? Is it okay to do that now or should they wait? I converted my garden to drip. I probably would not do it now because now this temp your garden is going to use be used to being irrigated on drip irrigation. The time to do that, I would probably recommend to do it in the fall and um, make sure the following year you monitor how deep that water is going and check uh, to see how your plants are doing. But the problem is right now we're going to get some really warm temperatures here very soon and your plants are being used to getting irrigated at a, a certain way and to change the way they're being irrigated uh, may be a problem. Uh, I had someone uh, had a question. They said they have earwig, earwigs. Uh, they're using mulch, but they're getting a lot of bugs. And they're not sure if they want to use poison or should be using poison on the bugs. So how would they deal with this? You know, that's a good question. I hear a lot of, you know, I'm a big believer in using mulch. And I keep hearing this, that uh, it attracts a lot of in insects. But Actually, those insects provide a very important purpose, right? They help break down that mulch uh, to a uh, what's called humus, and then the biology of the soil takes over, and that really improves your plants. I understand that a lot of these insects can be annoying. If they are, you know, if you want to get rid of the earwigs, you can go to pest notes from UC, and there are some chemicals you can use. Um, I personally have learned to live with the insects that come with my mulch. And what's amazing is over time, uh, you will have some insects that will come in uh, uh, that will actually go after the, the bad insects. I went through, when I went through the Master Gardener program, Norm Smith, Dr. Norm Smith was uh, the county entomologist for 30 years. And I'll, uh, I remember one thing he told me. For every bad bug, there's a good bug. And so I, I think the goal is to really create a balance in your garden and uh, the bugs will take care of themselves. Nature will run its course, but you can, if they're pestered to the point where you just can't accept it, uh, there are pest notes available for dealing with that. So Google UC pest notes. That's wonderful to know. Um, another question, just in a, another kind of practical sense, as you said, a lot of people rake up their leaves and they're picking up the lawn. And I think there's a perception that if you're not clearing out the ground, that somehow the water isn't getting through or to the soil or it's strangling, quote unquote, the uh, plants underneath. Is that true or is this just sort of a, a false that, belief? That is a false belief. Okay. The organic material in the soil, if I actually teach a class in what's called Unlock the Secrets in the Soil. What you want to do is to get, maximize your SOM or soil organic material. And what happens there is the soil actually comes to life. And when the soil comes to life, it actually, you know, it's, it can be very complicated, but it aggregates, it breaks apart. And it, when it breaks apart, that's how water and the life of the soil, earthworms, bacteria, fungus, can move through the soil efficiently and it is much healthier for your soil. So you definitely want to leave those leaves on your garden and grass cycle those uh, grass clippings. Okay, uh, let's see, have another question. Can you recommend a moisture tester? The best thing to do for moisture uh, for the home gardener, I believe is using a uh, long handled screwdriver. I have a two foot long screwdriver that I use and after I irrigate, I test after I irrigate to see that the water is getting uh, deeply into the soil. And if not, then I can adjust my run times in order to get the water down deeper. That's, it's a very inexpensive tool. I, you know, I have a smart control. I have every irrigation contraption that's available to the homeowner <laughs> and the best tool I have really for monitoring my irrigation is a long handled screwdriver. Usually the simple is the best. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Do you recommend a, re a certain website or resource uh, that would be the best uh, for finding drought 
uh, tolerant plants, especially one that might be a little bit of a cheat sheet for beginners. I know you mentioned that converting and going to drought plant it can be quite complicated and time consuming and over, I know for me, it can be overwhelming. Is there maybe a, a place or something that is a good start? Yeah, the UC, da UC Davis has tested over 200 plants uh, that will do well in our California climate. It's called the, U and they've come up with a list called the UC Davis Arboretum All-Stars. And they, what's neat about this program is they have been tested by UC to survive our California high temperatures in the summer, cold temperatures in the winter. And it's really a great resource. And is that on like a UC website, the UC Davis? Right. Google UC Davis Arboretum All-Stars. It okay. is, they actually have a searchable database. So for example, let's say you want a shade tolerant small plant, you can uh, do a search on that. Okay. Let's see Tim, here. I also have one thing that I'd like to share, mm -hmm. and I was just um, texting it in the chat. Um, if you go to www.calwater.com, they'll give you a list of low water and drought resistant plants. And I believe if you also look on the um, Fresno water management, they also have lists of plants that are considered drought tolerant. Yeah, and I'll, put that, in the, I'll put that in the chat. Okay, I uh, have one, another question for you, Tim. Uh, Lynn says, I live in new home construction in Clovis. Is the CCUH where I should go to plan my new backyard landscape to include some trees in the yard? I would go to the California Center for Urban Horticulture website to learn as much about uh, the new way of gardening in California. Uh, but the UC Davis Arboretum All-Stars, they have a function where you can uh, sort for trees that will do well in California. I'd also recommend, um, it, you know, I'm not really familiar with Clovis, but the city of Fresno also has a list of plants. I think Roz was, Roz talked about them. They may be helpful for you as far as uh, choosing trees. And one thing that I really would recommend is that uh, take a trip up to the UC Davis Arboretum and you can see a lot of these Arboretum All-Stars, what they look like uh, and uh, get a great idea for uh, planting your garden. Okay. Uh, another question. I have just planted trees. The roots are very short right now. How far out from the tree trunk do I water? You generally want to water to the canopy line. So as the tree grows, you're going to move your irrigation out farther. So uh, like I managed the tree fruit orchard up in Madeira, I have the uh, drip line set at about, oh, maybe two to three feet. Uh, a full grown uh, like peach tree, maybe five to six feet. So it all depends on the canopy size. Okay, actually then a follow-up question from someone else then it says for my large mature trees, do I water three feet deep for the entire area or water less as you get closer to the trunk? You generally want to water three feet for the entire area. You know, on these large trees, it's really quite amazing how deep and far their root structure goes. Uh, the important thing is to get that water down deep on the trees. Three feet would be great. That's easier said than done. That's, it's very difficult to get water down that deep, especially in the summer with these water restrictions, but you just have to do the best you can. Okay, uh, another question. Is it okay to use oak leaves as mulch under a redwood tree? I know of no problem with using oak leaves. Uh, at the Garden of the Sun, our demonstration garden, we had a lot of oak leaves and uh, we use it as mulch. It was amazing mulch. It was just, uh, I mean, dark, rich, composted oak leaves to me make amazing mulch. I know of no problem with using them under redwood trees. But the redwood needles are, are very good mulch too. One recommendation I might make is 
once they drop is that you go and you fluff them up every once in a while and water them down. That will help with the composting process. Okay. I'm, I know I'm learning a lot today. Um, let's see. Oh, had a question is, let's say, frankly, you're not very good with sprinkler systems. You know you've got a leak somewhere, you know some stuff needs to be worked on. Is there a site or a companies or something you should be looking for that might be more helpful to help you get this stuff repaired and up to uh, snuff? You know, as UC Master Gardeners, we can't recommend one company over another. Right, right. But if you go to the major manufacturers, they almost all have instructional videos hmm. and they're great. I use them all the time. You know, I was fortunate when I, uh, when I became a master gardener, I worked out at the garden and I managed the irrigation out there and the manufacturers came out there and actually trained me. But mm -hmm. there are many sources of information. Uh, you know, there's something like hands-on training. Right. So I was fortunate to get that, but these uh, webinars on site are usually very good. So you go to the major manufacturers and they generally have some great informational videos. Okay, let's see. Um... Don't see it. anyone else have some more questions or Tim, was there anything you'd like to expand on or maybe you think, oh, I should have mentioned this. You know, I, um, I think the big thing I, I, that I've emphasized and I hope that I got across is the water situation is tenuous in California. I was an ag appraiser for many years and as long I was, over 20 years, I worked in ag for 25, 30 years. And the water situation has always been an issue. It is something we are dealing with every year. And I'm expecting higher water rates. Uh, and the homeowner just really has to deal, needs to take the water situation seriously and learn to just deal with it. That's why I really emphasize people get smart controllers, learn about their irrigation systems, test their irrigation systems, do everything they can even though we're dealing with this situation, you can still have a beautiful garden if you plan and manage your irrigation system well. Okay, I have another question. It says someone had kind of left, it sounds like they deliberately have left their lawn unwatered and it's quote unquote converted itself over a couple of years to clover and fillery and other sort of weed appearing plants uh, com competing with a little bit of your meat Bermuda grass? Should they leave the clippings for mulch? You know, that is one situation where you want to be careful. Uh, if you grass cycle those weeds, those weed seeds are going to go back into the, the turf and create more weeds. So that may be one situation where you don't want to grass cycle. You want to remove those clippings, probably put them in the green can. And when you're if you have Bermuda turf, that is very competitive. It will outcompete your weeds. And once your Bermuda turf outcompetes those weeds, uh, then you can start grass cycling again. Okay. Uh, actually, it says, uh, what do I look for on my nice two foot long screwdriver um, when you're checking for that water depth? So when you uh, push your screwdriver into the soil, you can tell very quickly it will go quite easily through moist soil. It will uh, stop very quickly once you hit dry soil. So when, once you actually go out and test, it will become quite obvious to you how deep your water has gone. Okay, I have a couple mulch related questions here. Uh, one is where, do you have a, any recommendations on where people can get organic mulch? And also, uh, do you recommend a particular mulcher or grinder? As far as my recommendation for mulch is your own garden. A lot of people, you know, rake up their fall leaves and throw them out. Uh, some arborists will give away free mulch. Uh, I've never found one who's done that. I keep hearing that, but I've never found one who does that. Um, I think your best source of mulch is going to be your own yard waste. You know, years ago, uh, UC did a study on what was the best mulch in an avocado orchard. This was, I think, down in Ventura County. And they found that plain yard waste was, you know, 
it, it can be kind of complicated. It's called the carbon nitrogen ratio. And yard waste uh, ha, was the most effective mulch uh, for the avocado orchard. So I'm a big believer in using yard waste. I'm, you know, I'm trying to be innovative. I have pine needles, I have leaves, I have, uh, I do a lot of chop and drop. So I have a lot of, uh, you know, spent flowers, uh, anything, any organic material I can get a hold of, I use this mulch and eventually it will break down and actually look uh, quite good over time if you let it break down. Actually, this is a good question. Uh, dovetails into this nicely. As someone was asking, they said they have palm trees and have to thin the fruit. Can the fruit be mixed with mulch? And since people do have a lot of different fruit trees, uh, that would be a good question. You know, I'm not really familiar with the palm trees and the fruit with palm trees. Uh, whenever you compost. Oh, fruit, I'm sorry. I meant plum trees. If I said plum, palm. Trees. plum trees. Okay. Uh, sorry yeah, about that. Yeah, I can tell you, you want to be careful. UC is very adamant that the, uh, like, let's say you have a plum tree and the fruit falls to the ground underneath the plum tree, it can serve as a vector for disease. So you probably want to move it away from that plum tree. Uh, but I, um, I know in my orchard, I uh, take unspent fruit and I, I do mulch it, but I try to keep it away from the tree because it can serve as a vector for disease, insects and fungus mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, does a mature, would you consider a mature juniper tree um, water thirsty? I am not familiar whether it is or not. You can probably the manual that everyone goes to is the sunset. You can look up under the, the sunset has a book and it will tell you whether it is where exactly it stands as far as um, being a water wise plant or not. <laughs> Talking not about juniper. My yeah, guess talking, is it is very drought tolerant though. Yeah. Talking to kind of a funny thing here, talking about getting mulch or leaves. Um, Leah tells us that in the Woodlake areas, there are a lot of trees around the lake and she goes around in the fall and collects the leaves and everyone thinks she's nuts, but it sounds like she's being pretty thrifty. Yeah, she's, she's doing a great job. I mean, it's amazing to me how much yard waste when I, uh, you know, drive around in the fall, I see all these gardeners with these huge truck fulls of leaves and yard waste, and they're taking out to the dump that's just going to be, could have been used in someone's garden to really improve their garden. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Um, Tim, any last thoughts? Well, again, um, you know, I'm kind of on a thing here where I'm really trying to get homeowners in Fresno to take the water situation seriously. I think there's going to be, we have, the water rates in Fresno are very low. And if we were starting to pay what people in other parts of the state paid, I think that would get their attention very quickly. So we, we want to be ahead of the curve here. We want to uh, make our gardens as water wise as possible. I really like the Eye on Water app because that lets you know uh, very quick, just, you know, click on the app. You can find out how much water you're using. So just take the water situation seriously. It's part of having a home in California and it's just the way it is. And uh, so many, for so many years, I think it's, you know, we've taken the water situation uh, for granted. Uh, that's not, I don't see that in the future that we're ever gonna have a water situation like that again. I think it's always gonna be an issue. Okay, have time for one more uh, question for you. This has been a fantastic um, presentation. I just keep thinking of everything. I thought, you know, things I thought I was doing right and I was not. And I'm sure this is barely the tip of the iceberg if I really get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, one last uh, question. Someone asks, uh, what are the effects or if there are on fall, with fallen oak leaves on rosemary plants? You know, again, I, I'm not familiar with uh, oak leaves on rosemary plants. I can tell you again, my experience with oak leaves, they are an amazing mulch. They do have a high carbon ratio, which means they break down very slowly. But I know we used, uh, we made this oak leaf mulch out at the Garden of the Sun. There's a big oak tree out there. And that stuff was amazing. I used it everywhere and I had no problems with it. 
Okay. You know, it's possible there may be something in oak leaves that would affect rosemary. Rosemary is a very drought tolerant plant. Um, I would not, you know, there's a lot of other, if you have access to oak leaves, I would probably look at putting them on other parts of your garden before I put it on rosemary because rosemary is really a tough plant. Okay, I would just like to remind uh, everyone who's attended today that the Master Gardeners, you can send uh, sp specific questions on their website, uh, especially, you know, if you're like me, you got a lot of questions today came up in your head. So you can always follow up on the Master Gardener website. Uh, Roz, I'm going to hand it over to you if you'd like to discuss some of the upcoming programs that we're going to be having. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. And Tim, I just, oh, Tim, can you stop sharing? Stop sharing, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then I can share with everyone. Um, so Tim, thank you again. That was very, very informative on drought 2021. And I encourage um, our viewers who are watching today to uh, check the Master Gardener website to for your um, articles that you've written on irrigation and water management. But I did want to share with the public some up and coming events that are happening uh, with the library and Laura, I'm so glad that we're able to um, have our Zoom classes with you. You've made it very, very easy for us. But these are the upcoming events that are happening. On May 15th, I'll be doing a um, my Under the Spell of Succulents called Simplifying Succulents. And that's going to talk about um, plant identification and care. And that will be on May 15th at 10 o'clock in the morning. On May 22nd, I'll do the second part of that series, Sassy Succulents. And I'll talk about um, how you can use succulents in both containers and beautiful crafts that can be done with them. On June 5th, Annie Dahl will be doing a gardening with herbs. And um, I hope she tells you that there are some herbs that you can freeze and they taste just like the ones that you harvest during the summer. And then the third part of the um, successful succulents will be on June 19th and I'll be doing that. All of these classes, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning and we just scheduled or we're in the process of scheduling two uh, additional classes for the month of July and that will be um, Sharon Matson talking about hummingbirds and Robbie Cranch talking about houseplants. So our hummingbirds and House plants will be done in July. And to register for any of those classes, if you go to fresnolibrary.libcal.com and either, uh, I think what you have to put into the search engine is the name of the plant. So if you put, up, put in succulents, all three of the succulents will come up. And if you put in herbs, that will come up. And so let me share a few other uh, things. So. Um, these are just some of the plants, photos that I've taken that will be in the uh, Simplifying Succulents, my favorite Sunburst Daonium and a variegated Echeveria that I took while I was in um, Dublin, Ireland. Here's just something to remind you about gardening with herbs on Saturday, June 5th at 10 a.m. And then uh, an intro to our hummingbirds and houseplants that will be in July. Thank you, Roz. Um, I cannot tell you how much uh, we appreciate you and Tim and everyone else in the Master Gardener program who are donating your time and setting up these absolutely fantastic and incredibly informative programs. I thank everyone for coming. I hope we see you again. There's a lot of stuff coming down the uh, road here. So And thank Laura, you just again. one last thing. Oh, These yes. are all um, resources that you can use. Uh, the first one that um, 
MG Fresno takes you to the uh, Fresno Master Gardener website. The second one will take you to the helpline if you have additional questions or photos for the uh, Master Gardeners. And the last one um, will allow you to sign up for um, information coming from the Master Gardeners. And occasionally they do surveys um, just to find out if the classes are valuable and if we should continue them. But what I'd like to do is just if people want to take a photo of those classes that are coming up, they'll know the ones that we have um, scheduled already for May and June. And those ones for July will probably be scheduled on that May 15th uh, webinar with you guys. So thank you again, Laura. Thank you, Tim. It's wonderful being able to share our information with, um, with the folks from Fresno. So thank you again. And thank you, uh, Tim. You couldn't be more timely with this uh, heat wave hitting us so early this year. Um, like you said, I think the drought management is, is definitely something that is not going to go away and is going to be part of our future. And I really appreciate you giving us the heads up and the tips and there's a lot of information out there and really was a fantastic program today. Thank you. And I look forward to your succulents coming up, Roz. Well, I'm excited about teaching everyone about it. They're very, very uh, easy to grow. They're drought tolerant somewhat, um, <laughs> they again, need water at the right time. So I'll, I'll share a lot of that information over the next few weeks. Wonderful. And everyone have a good, safe weekend. Thank you. Thank you again, Tim. Take care now. <laughs>